So thank you. Uh, I have met you already uh, yesterday afternoon, so I'm very pleased to start this course with you this year, and I hope it will be a great year for all of us uh, together, because it is the first time for me that I talk to such a great number of economists and try to convince them of the great task ahead. So thank you. This course will be called Introduction Ecology, uh, to, uh, to the Ecological Challenge from a Multidisciplinary Perspective. As I told you yesterday, I am a geographer, uh, a researcher, and I, I am also the director of the Center for Earth Politics. And good afternoon. I am uh, Luc Abadi. I am professor of uh, ecology in the Sorbonne University, not far from this uh, campus. And I, I am also the head of the Institute for the Ecological Transition of uh, Sorbonne uh, University. And so we've been working with Luc together since now, I guess, almost 30 years. Uh, trying to solve the puzzle of how to convince people of the environmental stakes and urgency. And we are nowadays very much near, near as a goal, I guess, because more and more people come back to us and say, well, it's urgent to do something. And as we've been telling everybody that it was urgent since 30 years already, we're very happy today to <laughs> see so many people convinced. So. How did we, did we get to this stage of catastrophe? I think it is important to ponder upon the fact that for many years we had trouble to convince people that they were dependent on the biophysical uh, materiality of the world. I mean, it's like, you know, uh, we're all powerful and we don't need to take care of pollution, of uh, biodiversity erosion, we don't need all that. If you think, for example, of sociology, I mean, sociology was only driven by social facts. They didn't need to take care of the materiality. So this is very important to explain why, again, uh, two years ago, I was teaching in an art school, and in this art school, the art student told me that these kind of problems were, were not for them. I mean, it is an absolute constraint and reality for all of us. So this is something that we have to be very aware of. And the second point is the way we develop, what we call predation without return. And the term return is very self-explanatory because we think that recycling is one of the stake of the ecological challenge. So what are the ways out? Uh, we think that the term of ecological solidarity is very important. And when we mean ecological solidarity, we don't mean ecological solidarity just within uh, and between human beings, but also with all kinds of entities uh, at the, at the, uh, uh, on the surface of Earth, meaning also water entities, all kinds. And Luke will explain much better than I did, than I do today. And that means to think and implement an ecological responsibility in terms of rights, in terms of economy. Uh, so this is all uh, uh, glued together, merged together. So this is our plan, which problems, which actors, which interest, which situation, and we'll discuss that today with Luc. Maybe you want to add something to introduce? So the social and environmental crisis, as I uh, told you to introduce this uh, course, has been acknowledged since many years now, okay? Uh, it is a, a planet under pressure, we call that a planet under pressure, uh, 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 during the 20th century. But if you go back in time, you can see that even in the 19th century, as I will show, 
we did already know that this planet was going to be under pressure in the 20th or 21st century. So that goes back a long time in time, a, a, a long way in time. In 1972, there is a club of Rome, you may have heard of, and it, it, this uh, club, which was composed of physicists, of m math teachers, uh, did uh, write a report, a great report, great literature, which, was called, which is called the Meadows Report. And this report explains that exponential growth is unsustainable in the face of finite resource. So this is very important. But uh, for many economists, until at least the turn of this, of this century, I mean, it was sufficient to replace natural capital by artificial capital. I mean, it is like uh, this kind of capital where kind of uh, uh, put on the uh, 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 same balance. Uh, so it's very important to see that it's not the case anymore. We, just being aware more and more of the uh, specific nature of na natural capital. So in 1972, the issue was to avoid uh, an infinite explo uh, uh, exploitation. Now, the challenge is different. And since, uh, I guess, the turn of this century, the challenge is to return to the limits of this planet. And we'll discuss this question of limits. Uh, it's a very important thing, because uh, the finiteness of resource we have to do with the limited capacity of certain ecological regulation mechanism. And it's not goods I am talking about. It's not services I am talking about. I'm talking about regulation mechanism. And that's why we'll be talking about uh, planetary boundaries, which is one of the great topics we will uh, we will go to during this course. So this is the Meadows report, as you can see. I'll go fast on that. The idea is we introduce this course for one hour or so, and then we'll go back and forth. Uh, if you have questions, just feel free to talk afterwards. Uh, so this was the French version, and this is the faces of the people who have written this report, and the English version of, uh, of, the, of the report in question. So it was a couple, mainly. You can read this, uh, this report, because it's a very interesting one to see back in time. So. As you can see, uh, that the components of growth are exponential. It was part of this report. Uh, and it was calculated, uh, and maybe you can comment on this, uh, on this, uh, on this diagram. Uh, yes, maybe not in detail, but what is interesting in this, uh, with this book, it is the first time for a large public that was published something uh, about a prediction of the evolution of the planet. It was the first time that everybody could understand what is modeling and how we can use mo models to try to predict the, the future. And for that, it has a big impact uh, in the world. And of course, you can discuss a lot the, de the details of the prediction, but for the first time, we had uh, a quantitative prediction based on uh, observation of uh, commercial uh, exchange, rate of uh, oil consumption, and so on. And it was also, uh, as you can see here, maybe, uh, not really for the first time, but m once more for a large public, it was uh, a systemic thinking of the situation. And probably you know today the concept of socio-ecosystems. In fact, it was a view of what we call today socio-ecosystem, but it was 50 years ago, more or less. That means that a lot of people uh, were ready from a, an intellectual point of view to think uh, a different world. Thank you. 
So other books which were quite important when you go back in time, when you go back in ecological history, this book, which is uh, a book from uh, 1865. Uh, so the importance of this book is because it talks of the Earth as a planetary system. Now, if you think it's not only about ecosystem, it's about the, uh, you see, uh, the Earth as a totality, as a globality, as a regulation system. So this is quite important uh, as a point in history. Also, this guy in 1896, you see this chemist, Arrhenius. So already in 1896, he emitted the hypothesis of global warming. So you see it goes back, back in time. And it takes a long time for, for human society to move, <laughs> as you can see. So, yeah. And so after that, we had the Second World War. And just after this war, a, a book published uh, in the US by Fairfield Osborne. It was a sort of uh, statement about the quality of the planet, of the environment, and he, he described uh, the destruction of ecosystems, the question of the degradation of soils, he didn't discuss climate change, he didn't see uh, this, this point, but it was the first book uh, with a strong impact in the US about the degradation of, uh, of the planet, of ecosystems. And it was translated in many countries, and you, you, it was tr translated one year after in France, for example, and you can find uh, this book today very easily in all the, the bookshop. Another very important uh, uh, point of view was proposed by Rachel Carson. It was uh, she was a, a biologist, uh, and she published in uh, 1962 about a book about the pesticides, the use of pesticides uh, in agriculture, and she showed how these pesticides uh, destroy biodiversity. It had a very strong impact in the U.S. A few years later. U.S. decided to, um, uh, pardon? Yes, to, je le mot interdire, pardon. Withdraw, prohibit. Voilà. It was not legal to use pesticides, and especially DDT, a few years later after this book. And it was also translated into, into French and many very different languages. And if you don't know this book, you can read it, because it is incredible. Uh, it is absolutely uh, valid for the present situation of pesticides in the world, especially from the point of view of what we should do in research, etc. And after that, we had uh, this book by Jean Dorst. Jean Dorst was uh, a French, uh, in this case. He was professor of uh, biology in the Museum of Natural History uh, in, uh, in Paris. And he proposed the first book about the uh, destruction of biodiversity, the extinction of uh, species, the historical uh, extinction of species and the present risk of extinction. And once more, it was a very important book. It, it, it was translated, uh, it was translated into in, uh, 20 countries, if I, uh, I remember. So very strong impact. And in this case, this time, uh, it was a French, uh, it's not <laughs> so, so frequent at the international level. And for me, another very big change is a concept proposed by Paul Crudzen. Paul Crudzen is a chemist, a chemist of the atmosphere. Uh, he was uh, a Nobel Prize of uh, chemistry, and he proposed the concept of Anthropocene. That is very important because he explains with this concept that Humanity is now a major driver of the evolution of the planet. And probably it is the first time in the history of the planet that one species is able to transform the chemistry of the atmosphere, um, some process of natural selection, and so on. It was the first time, it is the first time that the species is able to transform at this point, at this level, uh, the 
dynamic, the dynamics of, of, uh, of the planet. And you said before, you used the word responsibility. Clearly, it is stated that we are responsible of this change. Okay, that's very new. We have a strong impact on the evolution of the planet. And maybe the last step from a historical point of view, it is this book published uh, in 2005. Uh, it is a Millennium Ecosystem Assessment. And it was also uh, a description of the state of the planet, of the ecosystems. And also it was uh, a description of the so-called ecosystem services. This, is, this was not new at this moment, but it was a popular version of this concept of ecosystem services. And ecosystem services means that nature, the functioning of nature, is providing to humanity some resources and the quality of life. And in this book, you have some incredible view, like this one. You see on the right, you have the freedom, your freedom of choice and action. That's very uh, heavy. And you have a rose with a box on the left, where we describe these famous ecosystem services. For example, the climate regulation, the soil formation, and so on. That means that we have a functioning of nature, something you don't see, you don't feel. It is sometimes very far from you. But in fact, it uh, drives, at least partly, the quality of your life. So that means that for the first time in the Western civilization, that we accept that we are dependent of nature. Until now, we were supposed to, to draw some resources from nature. We were supposed to more or less control nature. And now we, we say, OK, but we are dependent of spontaneous process. We don't know this process, and we're not really able to control this process. That's it, it, it is a completely uh, new view of uh, the relationship between men and nature. And probably, we need more hum uh, humility to build uh, this relationship with nature, with the species, and so on. Yes, oh, yes, yeah, you can. sure, you can make all photos you want. Hello? We might distribute it. We might, we might, if you want, we can distribute this introduction. I mean, uh, we'll, uh, I'll try to access online. I'm not sure I will succeed, but otherwise I will send it to David. So, uh, one thing which is important as we reverse this view of the relationship between humankind and nature is to see that these uh, biophysical processes are now thought as being the limited uh, drivers, the limiting drivers of our development. This is something which, are, which is very important. So there is a new concept since 2009, which was developed by a guy who, uh, whose name is Stephen, and it was much more developed afterwards by different people. And this uh, approach said that there are nine limits to the development of humankind uh, by the planet. So. These nine physical, biophysical processes will be developed during this course. We'll just uh, now, today, just uh, approach one or uh, three of these biophysical processes. But uh, in the later uh, courses, you will see more of them. So the climate change you have heard of, the erosion of biodiversity, which is a major issue but also the disruption of the biogeochemical cycles of nitrogen and phosphorus. And you can see on this slide that they are as important as other biophysical 
processes. So you, you see in the media nowadays, you hear about climate change very much, you hear about erosion of biodiversity, but you never hear or rarely hear about the cycles of nitrogen and phosphorus. You have to understand that all these processes are as important one as another in terms of balance uh, at the scale of the planet. Changes in land use, in 2018, the IPCC released its report on land use saying that w a part of the solution would be found in land use and managing better land use. The ocean acidification, uh, Luc will talk a bit about it today. The global water use, meaning the, uh, 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 so, not soft water, how do you say, uh, sweet water, no, uh, not salted, okay. sweet water. So the ocean ozone depletion, we still, uh, since uh, 1987 Montreal uh, uh, Accord, we still haven't recovered fully uh, the ozone uh, layer. The increase of aerosol in the atmosphere with dark particles and also the introduction of new entities into the biosphere, such as plastic or other entities. So you see this, you can find that very, uh, I mean, it's just an introduction today. There are many, many papers about these issues. Uh, you can see uh, that uh, uh, right now the biodiversity loss, the nitrogen cycle, the climate crisis are coded red. I mean, when the IPCC say code red, the other ones are not yet code red, but they are uh, they are getting very, very fast in this direction. And in France, uh, we have been doing the same work. I mean, trying to uh, depict uh, in different regions what were the, plan uh, what were the plane planetary boundaries which were over, uh, which, were, uh, which were used too much. And we found six of them. I mean, especially because we use a lot of pesticides, a lot of also uh, nitrogen through the, for, for agriculture and such and such. So, and so we, uh, we will not talk about France today, but uh, uh, it's possible to have some calls on this issue of planetary boundaries about uh, France. So, uh, what we say today is uh, uh, quantitative thresholds because you, you saw the, the lines around the hurt of the, the core of the diagram that quantitative thresholds have been defined for the nine limits and we're just going step after step. And in 2009, only three of them were crossed. Climate change, as I told you, biodiversity, nitrogen cycle disruption. Uh, and new thresholds then were, were took into account after tw uh, 2015. Uh, also the regional level, as I told you, for France and the process et heterogeneity. And now new boundaries crossed in terms of land use change because we can uh, see how, mu how much of the land is used uh, goes from forest to agriculture or from forest to uh, urban uh, areas and such and such. So this concept of global limits is now recognized widely. One question which we can ask, I will not ask it today, but mainly uh, perhaps in a later course, how we drive the planet in terms of governance. I mean, how can we think that it is possible to drive the planet with such limits? I mean, it is a very big issue in terms of political science, not only in terms of political science, economically speaking, too. You want to talk a bit? Because my, oh, wait. my mouth is getting <laughs> more thirsty. So, one of the last episodes, of course, was the COP21 in, uh, in Paris with the Paris Agreement. So maybe some comments, some positive comments about this agreement. Sometimes we need some positive information. <laughs> no, problem there. Well, 
So in fact, we, we, during this uh, conference, we had rather 200 countries uh, involved in this uh, conference. And very rapidly, this uh, agreement has been ratified by uh, a sufficient quantity of countries in order to be uh, operational. And so what is interesting, of course, it is the objective. We, tr we try to uh, stay below the level of 1.5 or 2 degrees of uh, increase of temperature in average at the global, uh, at the global level. There is not real legal constraint, but there is an obligation. Each five years, the countries have to report to explain what they did, and they have, above all, the obligation to propose something more ambitious for the next five years. So it is a sort of a mechanism of permanent increase of the ambition. And what is also interesting is that the starting point is dependent of the situation of the countries. We don't impose the same objectives. The different countries themselves decide what they are able to do during five years. So we, in fact, we have a permanent mechanism of permanent uh, improvement of the, poli of the policies. And we have also, we, we take into account in this agreement, the diversity of the countries of the situation, of the culture, and so on. So this is quite something interesting through this uh, uh, dynamic and uh, diversity of point of view. And in fact, the policies before, for example, the Kyoto Protocol, failed because it was a story from government to government. Now it's, it's a public story, and so there is a, a very important role to play for the citizens and the NGOs, because now Everything is in the head, in the end, pardon, excuse me, Oula. in the end of, uh, of people, of civil society, in fact. Alors, a few information about, about the, the, the carbon. As you know, the increase of CO2 in the atmosphere is a major driver of climate change. It is also a change in the chemistry of atmosphere. So we will come back in the next uh, lecture about that. But uh, it changed many things for plants, for example, for the growth of plants. So we have an accumulation of carbon in the atmosphere. A part of, this, of the carbon produced by humanity goes in the atmosphere. A part goes in the ocean. And the third part goes in the ecosystem. So it is not a very beautiful picture, but maybe it's interesting to have a, an idea of the quantities, of the amounts of carbon. So just a, a comment. We have very important uh, reservoir of carbon in the soil. So we can continue during a long time to increase the emission of CO2. Uh, in the atmosphere, we, we have rather, rather more than 50% of increase of the carbon concentration since one century. And what is interesting is to look at the amount in vegetation and in soil. If you compare these two amounts to the amount in the atmosphere, you clearly see, and people have seen that uh, 40 or 50 years ago, uh, that if we are able to increase a bit uh, a small amount of the carbon in this compartment, we could have a significant impact on biodiversity. This is the reason why a major challenge, probably as you know, is a question of deforestation, afforestation, reforestation, and the use of soils. Because, for example, when you uh, uh, convert a forest soil into an agricultural soil, you lose a lot of carbon. And sometimes this carbon was in the soil for one century or 1,000 years. Okay. And it was not supposed to, to be uh, in, in the cycle, in fact. It was out of the cycle, but when you uh, cultivate the soil, you emit this fossil, more or less fossil, carbon from the soil. So it's clearly a challenge. Huh? What we do with forest and with soil 
in order to help to decrease the rise of the, of the CO2 uh, in the atmosphere. So, of course, there is not only CO2, there is methane, uh, another very uh, dangerous uh, gas. We have N2O. N2O is a fourth uh, greenhouse gas. Uh, N2O is directly linked to agriculture. When you bring nitrite to promote the growth of plants, in some conditions, you are able to emit uh, N2O. And there is a question, finally, of the uh, way we manage the nitrogen fertilization in agriculture. And today, more or less, uh, we bring, for example, in uh, Western countries, we bring two times more nitrogen than the quantity uh, obtaken by the plant. So there is also something to do with nitrogen in agriculture. In fact, when you see clearly the problems, you also cl clearly see what could be the solutions? So, the increase in temperature, uh, I am not uh, a climate uh, scientist, but people uh, studying climate explain that the rate of increase is between 5 and 10 times faster than the faster process we observed during uh, the quaternary, quaternary uh, era. So, we have something quite instantaneous, in fact, in terms of increase of the CO2 in the atmosphere. It's something very new in the recent history, and probably in the history, of the, of the planet. So, bef uh, besides the question of carbon, everybody knows the question of climate change, we have also the question of biodiversity. It's clearly uh, a big ecological catastrophe as the climate, uh, the climate uh, crisis. And so, uh, what does it mean? Maybe we can show the drawing. Uh, well, it is, it's quite easy to explain what is CO2 and what is the warming of atmosphere. It's more complicated to explain what is biodiversity and why it is so important. In fact, traditionally, we explain that we have different levels of biodiversity. The simple level, everybody knows, is the number of species, the diversity of species. But in fact, b uh, behind this diversity of species, we have a diversity of genetic information. The genetic information is different from a species to another, but it is also different from an individual to another within the same species. So we have this question of diversity. What does it mean? How can we manage this diversity, this genetic diversity? And at a higher level, we have also the uh, diversity of ecosystem. I will come back on that immediately. Uh, and the organization of landscape, the level of heterogeneity, I would say, of the landscape. That it is a key point. Uh, nature is not homogeneous. It is heterogeneity. The key word when you study biology, is heterogeneity. And probably this view of heterogeneity of nature is a source of solutions. Okay. Uh, voilà. <laughs> Pardon. Tu veux voir? Oui, je vais bientôt te complètement. Uh, so, uh, in fact, this is the story uh, of the evolution of life, the diversity of life forms during the, uh, the, the history of the planet. So we see different crises. The last crisis, uh, the last we, was uh, uh, the crisis of, um, at the end of the Cretaceous period with uh, the, uh, the extinction of din uh, dinosaurs. But we, have, we had, in fact, five big crises of extinction in the history of the Earth. Five big and probably at now we know 60 different periods of crisis. Crisis means that during millions of years, we had, uh, you had, uh, you had we, a very strong rate of species extinction that was not balanced by the rate of uh, uh, 
uh, speciation, in fact, OK? But what is interesting in this figure is that after each crisis, up, it starts again. And when you look at the detail of this uh, uh, evolution, I don't know if I have it, no, I have not In fact, you, you are more, you, more or less, you have something that is exponential. There is a trend of life. There is a divers, an, uh, an infinite diversification of the life forms. And this is uh, a process that is more and more rapid with time. And we clearly that, huh? we, cl we can clearly, clearly see that after different crises, we have, uh, we, we, we come back uh, on the process of extinction and some new forms appear. Là, c'est le nombre de familles, c'est on the left. Oh, okay, okay. The ouais. on, the, on the left, yeah. yeah, yeah. And one thing, it's important, I mean, I just realized that the other day, I mean, I am quite slow, but uh, it's that the dinosaurs resisted during 150 million years. I mean, they just reigned over the Earth during 150 million years, while in 45,000 years, we destroyed everything. I mean, it's like no. when you put that into balance, you see, there's something which uh, I don't know. Uh, you are perfectly right. It is a key point. What is happening with biodiversity is not new. We observed that many times in the history of the planet. But the rate is absolutely incredible. After the big extension of uh, the Permian period, just after 300 million years uh, in uh, in the past, we uh, lost, uh, if I remember, something about 70 to 80 percent of the families in the ocean. The process of this decrease took between one and four million years. Yeah. This is the rate of a crisis in the history of the planet. Clearly, at the moment, we are not in this rate. And if you look at the geological time scale, you can say that what is happening with biodiversity now is an instantaneous event. There is no dynamic. It's puff. It's finished. The biodiversity decreases very, very, very rapidly. Uh, yes, we have some historical records showing that the expansion of humanity uh, induced very rapid decrease. For example, the birds in the uh, Pacific Ocean. Uh, when we have the colonization of uh, uh, Tonga Island and so on, we have a uh, an extension of birds uh, very rapid. And this extension was around 10% of the total diversity of birds at the global scale. So we have some uh, very good uh, record. It was not a direct effect of humanity. Very often it was linked to the rat, for example, uh, the cat, etc. we had with people. Uh, and the, the direct exploitation of biodiversity generally is not the main problem. The problem is that with uh, the change of the landscape, of course, and the animals, comment on dit ça, les commensaux, comment on dit ça? Yeah, uh, uh, animals which live with us, voilà. like cats, all domestic animals, you know. We bring them and everything goes insane voilà. because of cats, because of dogs, because of rats. Voilà. Uh, we rats, rats, uh, for example, <laughs> and, uh, rats uh, eat the eggs of the birds. So. Yeah, that's <laughs> it's, 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 it's a simple catastrophe. Yeah. Voilà. Uh, so, on this uh, figure, you have uh, some data, quantitative data, about the uh, rate, for the rate, the proportion of uh, species extinct uh, on the recent past during the last five centuries. Or why the last five centuries? Because f uh, five centuries ago, we had the first uh, travels of, uh, of uh, biologists in the world. Uh, uh, Charles Darwin and so on, so it was later, of course. So at this, at this moment, we have the first description 
of species that are serious description and so we can uh, exactly know what species is still present or what species has disappeared. And so you see that for different groups in uh, five centuries, we uh, can have around one to two percent of the species that have disappeared during five centuries. As far as we know, it is absolutely incredible. Uh, we, we didn't observe that in the past of the planet. Okay? And of course, this is an underestimation because it is only on the species that has been observed in 1,500 years ago. Okay? So, of course, it is a big species, a big mammal, the big trees, etc. And all these small organisms are not uh, in, this, uh, in this figure. So, it's very clear. So, at the moment, uh, we should have 10 species extinction. We are, we are, uh, uh, we are ju uh, over the limit that has been estimated uh, from this geological record. Okay? Uh, we sh we the limit is uh, 10 species extinction for a million species per year. Uh, and we are uh, clearly above uh, this, uh, this limit. So just for the fun, <laughs> a few years ago, some scientists decided to to quantify, to measure all the living organisms on the planet in terms of tons of carbon. The first result is very clear. We are a planet dominated by plants. Most of the living carbon is made of plants. And we have, of course, uh, uh, bacteria, uh, fungi, and animals. If we go to the animals, We have a planet dominated by arthropods, uh, invertebrates, more generally. And for vertebrates, we have wild mammals, we have the humans, and the livestock, linked, of course, to uh, food production. And you see, for example, that uh, we are eight times more human than mammals on the planet today. We have 1.8 times more farm animals than humans and 14 times more farm animals than wild mammals. Well, what is interesting in this data is that it, it shows that we have changed the nature of nature. Okay? We have changed the nature of biodiversity the organization of biodiversity. And in fact, most of this biodiversity is, a, in this case, under the direct control of humanity. And for that, the discussion about uh, the, the decrease of uh, cattle breeding and so on, uh, of course, is very uh, important when you use that. Now, there is a question, OK, biodiversity is decreasing, but we have million and million species uh, on the planet, maybe it is not so dramatic. Uh, in fact, the question of the meaning for humanity of this loss of biodiversity is very complicated because when you look at one species, a duck in this case, you can uh, show all the relationship, and it is only uh, the uh, trophic relationship and the, the exchange of food, uh, what, the, the, what is the food of the duck, and you see that this dog is involved in a very big, complex system of relationship. And this is uh, the job of the ecologist today to understand that, because of course, we have a complex system. A complex system means we have a lot of components. And all these components are more or less linked by actions, by influence on the others, and by uh, feedback from one species to another. So we have interactions. We are involved in a system of interaction. That means that if you change something somewhere, you will change more or less everything everywhere. The question is, what will be the intensity of this change and where 
it will occur. Well, and this is the reason why it is very complicated sometimes to explain, to make prediction about the dynamic of biodiversity. Uh, what is it? Ah, oui. This is the, um, uh, an estimate of the uh, extinction risk uh, in the world and in France. You see that in France we, we have big problems because we have a part, an important part of our biodiversity in tropical uh, area, in uh, Guyane, in, uh, in uh, Réunion, etc. This risk of extinction uh, can be assessed through data about the capacity of the uh, species to spread in the landscape, what we uh, call the uh, migration rate, to survive the species has to move in the space, especially with climate change. We have also uh, a, a good uh, technique to evaluate this risk through the expansion of the uh, agriculture, for example, because we know that there is a strong link between the area the, the habitat surface of the species and the extinction risk of the species through, for example, uh, genetic, uh, uh, genetic uh, problems. Okay? So uh, these uh, predictions are quite sure in terms of scientific uh, information. Uh, with climate change, you know that climate change is going to change the distribution of rainfall and temperature in space. Uh, for example, in, f in France, for one degree on average, one additional degree of temperature, uh, you have a movement of the climate uh, areas of uh, 150 kilometers to the north. That means that the species has to have to follow the migration of the climate uh, region what we, we call in uh, ecology the climate envelope of species. Each species uh, needs a certain range of temperature and water. And if this, this range change, the species has to move. So we have a lot of species that have to move 150 kilometers in one century for one degree. If we go to two, three, four degrees, of course, it will be much more. And so there is a sort of race between the climate movement and the species movement. And we know that some species will lose the race. And clearly, for most of trees, for example, uh, the race is lost for, for the trees. And on this map, you have the distribution of beach on the left and the prediction of the distribution of beach in one century in France. And so if we want to conserve some species, <laughs> we have to help them to move in space. There is a new science uh, now. Uh, uh, je sais pas comment on dit ça en anglais. The, the migration, the uh, uh, assisted mini. Migration. Voilà. voilà. You Et imagine ça. some trucks uh, with trees <laughs> going to the north of the country. <laughs> well, another effect is of course on the ocean. Uh, as you probably know, when you combine CO2 with water, it produces carbonic acid. So that means you increase the acidity of ocean. And acidity means that the uh, synthesis of calcium carbonate, the major uh, matter of the plankton, of the shells, etc., uh, this is more difficult. So we predict and we observe uh, some effect on all the organisms having uh, uh, skeleton with uh, having organs rich in uh, calcium carbonate and we, we observe also some change in the reproduction rate of some species etc. So we can predict uh, a very strong effect of this uh, acidity on marine biodiversity. So there is also the increase of the temperature of water and we observe big migration at the moment of, uh, of fishes, for example, in, mid, in the Mediterranean Sea, we have more than 1,000 fishes that are not uh, local, that are recent, they are moving uh, because of the temperature. Pardon. Yes. 
So this is the physical part. I told you about the nine boundary, uh, planetary boundaries, but these issues about planetary boundaries were met with the donut concept. I don't know how many of you have heard about this concept? Most of you. Okay, so we'll discuss it afterwards because it's the idea to reconcile improved living condition with respect for the, for, for the biosphere. So I'm not going to expand very much if you know about it already. You have uh, discussed it last year, is that it, in Vienna? I guess you have studied it in Vienna, more or less. Okay, so uh, one thing, it adds to limits. I mean, it means that the uh, safe space for humanity development is very much reduced. In terms of policy making, it has strong consequences. If you see how many people are resisting uh, the vaccination, for example, in France, you can imagine what it means in political terms to think the development of such a species as ourselves in terms of such limits. I think th this is one thing we have to just not know the facts, the models, but also the political consequences of such models in terms of how we can think of ourselves in the future. Do you think that you'll be able to stay in the green in between that? Well, that's an issue, I guess. So if you know about that, I'm not going to say too much about it, uh, just to say that uh, the social flow and the environmental ceiling are very much concept, uh, trying to describe this safe space uh, in between the planet planetary boundaries we have been discussing and what uh, what uh, kind of uh, social, of quality of life we can expect in different countries. And there is this uh, terrible, perhaps you know this image. Did you discuss it last year? No? I mean, I, I, I think we can exchange about this image. You see, this is the social thresholds which are achieved in different countries, and this is the biophysical boundaries which are transgressed. Okay? So what you can see, for example, is uh, the higher up means the more social thresholds, such as, I am going to just present them a bit, if I go back, uh, for example, you have life satisfaction, healthy life expectation, nutrition, sanitation, income, access to energy, education, which is a very important thing, social support, democ democratic quality, quality, employment. So different kind of indicators which uh, are resumed in this uh, in this scheme. So it means, for example, that Germany, which is higher up, I mean, meets a, lo a, a great number of social thresholds in terms of quality of life, education, but it span, it has uh, crossed a lot of biophysical boundaries. And if you go, Malawi has not crossed any biophysical uh, boundaries, but it has no Social, social thresholds achievement. So, so, so it's very, uh, 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 such uh, 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 an image is very grim because it means that if you don't cross any biophysical boundaries, you can't achieve any of what we had achieved since la last 500 years. But I guess that the devil is in the details, as we say. I don't know if you say it in English, but in French we say it. And if you take the difference between Germany and United States, for example, you see that United States has uh, crossed uh, much more biophysical boundaries, but has reached a lower quality of life. So I guess you, you have to look at this uh, schema uh, in the details, in between certain group of countries and see what it means in terms of what it has reached. Also, you have to look at this schema, thinking that in a lot of countries, for example, you take South Africa and Swaziland uh, uh, in, the, in the right, uh, lower right, 
and you think that these two countries are exporting a lot of their goods towards Europe, for example, of other states. So it's just a question of who, to whom profit the crime. I mean, you have to, so it's not the real weight of these countries for themselves. It's also the, the price they're paying for expanding the quality of life in other countries. So this schema doesn't say that, it just say how much each country weighs. So it's a bit false, you have to, to understand that. But nonetheless, it's a very interesting uh, picture, I think. And uh, so, well, we, we, we'll discuss it afterwards because uh, David was very severe. He, he told me, you just speak one hour and you have to let them talk one hour. So I, I guess we're reaching the one hour and I'm speeding up a bit. Uh, okay, so that I have said, uh, and uh, I think also you have uh, to understand something, it's to finish and to conclude that there are various players that's, uh, involved in this game. Uh, what uh, Luc didn't say about the COP21, it was the first time, or I, I didn't hear it may, perhaps, it was the first time that civil society was very much involved in the making of such uh, agreement, uh, because just governments couldn't do such an agreement by themselves, as a Kyoto was a failure, mostly. Uh, and in between these various players, uh, uh, it's visible that certain players have their own interest at stake. Uh, I guess there is one novel which could be interesting for you to read. It's a science fiction novel which is called The Ministry of the Future. Did you hear about this novel? So it's a novel by an American writer wh whose name is Kim Stanley Robinson and he, he tries to modelize in narratively, uh, how we could solve these problems. I mean, if the players which are right now involved into this game are unable to solve the climate change issue, what kind of players should we imagine in order to solve the problem? And his idea is to create a ministry of the future. I mean, this is a new kind of player as it, as it is described in the book. So this is to say that a lot of groups are, are, are actively reducing the impact of the environmental crisis because they have their own interest at say at hurt and not the common good. Okay, cities have been doing a lot. Uh, this year, I'm not going to talk about cities very much, but uh, uh, they have been doing more than government sometimes about climate change, mitigation and adaptation, because we don't, uh, try, we don't talk too much about adaptation, but it's quite a different issue from uh, mitigation. Citizens, uh, right now, I don't know if you have followed, but uh, uh, there are more and more judicial processes engaged by citizens. For example, in France, we had uh, l'affaire du siècle, how it can be the century affair. I mean, it's like citizens which gazed, regrouped, and just trialed the state for not uh, complying to the Agreement of Paris stakes. And the Agreement of Paris was not normative as such, but it just builds an horizon uh, for, the, the, for, 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 for such trials at the, national st uh, at the national scale. And to finish, uh, there is also one thing which will uh, play a great role in the, in the solution to crime, it's the anxiety. I mean, you have, you have heard, I guess, of eco-anxiety, uh, solastalgia. I mean, I think it's a known, well-known, I am just doing a conference for psychoanalysts at the end of the week. So as uh, they have been uh, receiving more and more patients with clinical troubles 
uh, relating to cli uh, climate issues, and they don't know how to treat them, how to respond to them. It means that they have to change also their profession. So this will play a great political role, negatively and positively. It means that positively, it means that these people who are anxious will want the government to do something for climate issues, but it can also uh, have a negative uh, expression, such as denial or all kind of psychological uh, loop. And one of these psychological loop uh, with which I will finish is the cognitive dissonance. Maybe you have heard of that too. I mean, you just convince yourself that you're dreaming, that other people are lying, that these are fake news. I mean, you have a lot of ways of just not complying with what has been asked of you. This is very important as a mechanism. It has been very much studied for cigarettes, for example, or for health issues. It is very much uh, also important for the climate change and, bio and environmental crisis. So, to finish, uh, reasons of, for ignorance, uh, religious worldview, survival, destruction of consumer culture, failure of educational system. Right now in France, we're trying to see what, uh, I mean, uh, Luc is participating to this group, how we can change uh, the higher education in order to miss this challenge, because there are not enough courses, are not well structured. So deception promulgated by individual and groups, and also ideologies of all kind. You know, and, I, and neoliberal ideologies are very strong at that. <laughs>